I would like now to invite Professor Susan Akram to the podium. And Professor Akram will be speaking on Palestinian refugees and the United Nations. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I, I often think of the Palestine-Israeli conflict as the fault line of the world's conflicts. And I think the Palestinian refugee situation is the fault line of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. So I'd like to um, do a very quick overview in the time that I have of the UN framework for Palestinian refugees, starting out with giving you some figures because I think it's important to start from the same foundation. Um, the Palestinian people constitute one of the largest and longest standing unresolved situations of displacement in the world. About half the refugees in the world are Palestinian. Approximately 66% or 7.4 million of the entire population of 11.2 million Palestinians is forcibly displaced. Among those displaced are at least 6.8 million Palestinian refugees and another 519,000 internally displaced persons. Palestinian refugees make up three general categories. The largest group of 5.8 million is 1948 refugees and their descendants. The second group, approximately 1 million, are the 1967 refugees and their descendants. And the third is an unknown number of neither 48 nor 67 refugees who have been displaced outside of historic Palestine and continue to be displaced today due to ongoing Israeli measures. In addition to refugees are Palestinians who are internally displaced within historic Palestine and Israel. And there are two main groups. The first are the internally displaced within Israel from the 1948 conflict, approximately 360,000 people. And the second are Palestinians who have been internally displaced since 1967. And as I mentioned, there's ongoing Palestinian displacement in all categories until today due to Israeli measures such as home demolitions, residency cancellations or restrictions, ongoing military actions, land seizures, and other actions forcing Palestinians out of their homes and lands virtually every day. Now the majority of Palestinian and IDP internally displaced population remains in the Middle East in the Arab countries bordering Israel and the occupied territories. Of the total refugee population, 4.8 million are registered with, for assistance with the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine, UNRWA. Another 1 million are refugees in the region, but they're not UNRWA registered. According to UNRWA registers, uh, registers about 1.5 million Palestinians were registered, are registered in 58 official refugee camps throughout the occupied territories, Jordan, Lebanon, and Syria, the five fields in which UNRWA operates. In addition, several hundred thousand Palestinian refugees reside in another 17 unofficial camps in the same areas. So this gives a very brief overview of the numbers of persons who comprise the Palestinian displaced and refugee population worldwide, just so we know who we are talking about today. Underlying the contentious nature of the Palestinian refugee problem is a lack of consensus about who is a Palestinian refugee as a matter of law. What rights apply to them? Whether they're entitled to protection from the international community, and what obligations the United Nations has towards this population. Refugees around the world simply by recognition of their status are guaranteed through treaty and through UN agencies, primarily the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees or UNHCR, 
the intervention of the international community in seeking and implementing their rights to return home, to obtain integration in host countries, resettlement in third states, restitution of their properties, and a whole host of core rights that are guaranteed and in fact being implemented every day as we speak around the world for other refugees. Now the Israeli position disputes whether Palestinians are refugees at all, whether the UN has any special obligation towards them, and hence whether they're entitled to the durable solutions required for other refugees as a matter of international law and practice. These positions, due to the weakness of the UN framework and the failure of the UN to enforce the large body of resolutions it has passed in support of Palestinian refugee rights, have permeated all the negotiations for a settlement to the conflict, contributing to an erosion of rights recognition with serious consequences for a durable solution, a just solution of the refugee problem. Now I'll focus my testimony on the problem of the definition of a Palestinian refugee, the obligations of the UN and its agencies towards them, and the consequences of the UN's failure to implement, implement its own framework. So who are Palestinian refugees? What refugee rights Palestinians have under international law relates directly to whether they are defined as refugees as a legal matter, an issue that is much more complex than simple reference to the international definition applied to other refugees would suggest. There is, in fact, more than one definition of Palestinian refugee depending on the function of the definition. The first action the UN took following the partition resolu uh, resolution was the passage of Resolution 194 on December 11, 1948. Under Resolution 194, the General Assembly established the first agency with a specific mandate towards Palestinians, the United Nations Conciliation Commission for Palestine, or UNCCP. The UNCCP had a very broad mandate to resolve both the conflict and the massive refugee problem, describe the refugees for whom the UNCCP would provide international protection, and in 194 paragraph 11, set out a very specific legal formula for resolving the refugee problem. And that formula, I quote, is that the refugees wishing to return to their homes and live at peace with their neighbors should be permitted to do so at the earliest practicable date. Compensation should be paid for the property of those choosing not to return and for loss or damage to property, which, under principles of international law and equity, should be made good by the governments or authorities responsible. Although no clear definition of Palestinian refugee is incorporated in the language of Resolution 194, the UNCCP's authoritative analysis of paragraph 11 of this resolution gives, that, uh, gives the definition that the delegates were relying on, and that is the term refugees applies to all persons who have been displaced from their homes in Palestine. This would include Arabs in Israel who have been shifted from their normal places of residence. This was the definition accepted by the drafters of Resolution 194 for purposes of defining the entire group of Palestinians who were entitled to the protection of the international community. Now this definition is markedly different from the universally adopted definition of refugee that appears in the important international in instruments, but it's consistent in the general legal understanding that a refugee is an individual meeting certain criteria who lacks the protection of his or her state of nationality or origin. It's the lack of protection from a refugee's own state that places the burden on the international uh, community to provide that international, that substitute international protection. Now this concept also underlies the extension of international protection towards persons who are stateless, that is, persons who are not recognized nationals of any state as a matter of law or fact, and persons who are internally displaced in situations where the state of origin or nationality fails to provide protection. The definition of Palestine refugee 
for purposes of international protection and the UNCCP's mandate is different from, and now we come to the second definition, first being the UNCCP 194 definition, and now a second definition, which is the definition, the operable definition for UNRWA, the agency providing assistance to those among the refugees who were in need. UNRWA coverage extends to registered and certain categories of non-registered Palestine refugees residing only in UNRWA's areas of operation. UNRWA has defined Palestine refugees for its purposes as any person whose normal place of residence was Palestine during the period 1st June 1946 to 15 May 1948 who lost both home and means of livelihood as the result of the 48 conflict. It should be noted that this definition of refugee was originally intended only for those eligible amongst the refugee population who were to receive poverty assistance. As the definition explicitly states that the refugee must have lost both home and means of livelihood to be eligible for registration with UNRWA. Although UNRWA has expanded its definition over the course of time and dropped the specific needs-based uh, requirement, registration remains on an individual basis and for specific categories of those refugees found in the UNRWA areas. Thus, for the purposes of repatriation or compensation, as envis envisaged in General Assembly Resolution 194, the term Palestine refugee for UNRWA is a much different and much more restricted meaning than that for the UNCCP and for General Assembly Resolution 194. Now we come to the third definition. The third definition relevant to Palestinians as refugees is that incorporated into two provisions of the 1951 Convention relating to the status of refugees. This is the universal treaty that protects and guarantees the rights of refugees around the world. And um, the two important uh, provisions are Articles 1A2 and Articles 1D. I'm sorry to give you the, the numbers, but it helps us uh, to keep them straight. The Article 1A2 definition, which is referred to as the universal definition of refugee because it has been basically universally adopted by states, has been widely misunderstood in reference to Palestinians and in relation to that other provision, Article 1D. It is this ambiguity between these provisions that is used to support the position that Palestinians are not refugees. Article 1A2 of this convention incorporates an individualized universal definition of refugee that prohibits a state party from returning or sending an individual to a state where he or she faces persecution for reasons of race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or social group. A second clause, Article 1D in the Refugee Convention, has a very different definitional criteria, and although it doesn't mention any particular group, it was meant to apply exclusively to Palestinians. Article 1D states that the Refugee Convention shall not apply to persons who are at present receiving from organs or agencies of the United Nations, other than the UNHCR, protection or assistance. You know, of course, what that is referring to, the UNCCP, which had already been established, and UNRWA, which had been established a year later. Article 1D has a second sentence, which states that when such protection or assistance has ceased for any reason without the position of such persons being definitively settled in accordance with the relevant UN resolutions, these persons shall ipso facto be entitled to the benefits of this convention. Now, Article 1D's two clauses have been subjected to widely divergent interpretations by states, the UN, and experts in the field. The most widely held interpretation is that 1D is an exclusion clause preventing Palestinians from being recognized as refugees since UNRWA is assumed to be providing them international protection. Two other provisions apply to the status of Palestinians as subjects of international law that I will just briefly mention. They're important here. Article 1 of the Stateless Persons Convention and Paragraph 7C of the Statute of the UNHCR. Both inc incorporate exclusion clauses 
similar to the first sentence of Article 1D, and the Palestinians are the only ones who qualify for being excluded from those uh, instruments. The prevalent interpretation of these provisions has had very severe consequences for Palestinians seeking benefits as refugees, as stateless, and as displaced persons worldwide. As a result, Palestinians have been precluded from many of the critical aspects of international protection, the most important of which is their long-term desire for protection, intervention, and mechanisms for obtaining a durable solution to their condition as refugees and as stateless persons. However, the drafting history indicates that 1D was intended to only conditionally exclude Palestinians from the main treaties that were focused, after all, on the obligations of resettlement states because the solution for their condition was repatriation to their homes and homeland and not resettlement. The consensus that was embodied in Resolution 194's Para 11 incorporates a very specific durable solution in a particular hierarchy of order. Return, number one, restitution of property and compensation for Palestinian refugees. The definition of Palestinian refugees referenced in Resolution 194 related to the entire population of Palestinians who were displaced from Palestine, and it was this entire population that was to have the benefit of a special protection regime. Guaranteed by the UN in the creation of two agencies dedicated just to the Palestinians, one to ensure implementation of the required durable solution, UNCCP, and one to ensure humanitarian assistance until the refugees could return home, UNRWA. Because this separate and special regime had already been established by the time the refugee and stateless conventions were drafted, the UN delegates did not want the Palestinian refugees to be subsumed with other refugees in the new treaty scheme that focused on resettlement. Hence, they omitted Palestinians from these treaties and the mandates of these agencies that were to implement them. The second clause of Article 1D was drafted to ensure that if either of the UN agencies set up for their protection was to fail, Palestinians would automatically be covered by the refugee treaties and the UNHCR. So where are we today in light of this scheme? The overall lack of agreement on a recognized legal status integrally relates to the conditions in which the majority of Palestinian refugees find themselves today. Palestinians worldwide are in significant ways measurably worse off on the whole from their fellow non-Palestinian refugees or stateless persons in similar circumstances. And a great measure of this is due to the legal framework I have just set out. I'll focus on just a few points to illustrate this. First, as I mentioned, Palestinians were def excuse me, defined as an entire group or category under the key resolution defining their rights and the international obligation towards them, General Assembly Resolution 194. However, its definition of Palestine refugees applies today to a population of Palestinians, including a third generation of approximately 6.8 million out of the 11.2 million Palestinians worldwide. The agency that was to identify the beneficiaries of that definition and provide them the full panoply of international protection, UNCCP, has become defunct as a practical but not a legal matter. Under the operating definition and the regime originally established for Palestinian refugees, Palestinians were to remain the direct responsibility of the United Nations until the durable solution of return, restitution, and compensation as spelled out in paragraph 11 of General Assembly one, uh, Resolution 194 was achieved. Second, neither UNRWA nor UNHCR has filled the lacuna left by the demise of the UNCCP. UNRWA has no mandate for specific refugee protection in the sense of seeking, implementing, or promoting durable solutions for Palestinian refugees. In related areas of protection of Palestinian human rights, UNRWA has continued to expand its role in many areas based on the statements of its commissioners general and on General Assembly resolutions commending its protection work. But even so, 
UNRWA's protection activities extend to only a subset of the entire Palestinian refugee population, those in its five geographic areas, and does not extend by its own admission to the search and implementation of durable solutions for the population within its mandate. UNHCR's interpretation of who is a Palestinian refugee and who in that population is entitled to UNHCR and refugee convention benefits is inadequate to address the protection gap. UNHCR takes the position that Palestinians outside UNRWA's areas who are Palestine refugees or displaced persons under the applicable resolutions are entitled to be recognized per se as refugees. That interpretation has two critical consequences. It means that a refugee protection definition applies to only half of the global Palestinian population of refugees or stateless persons. It also means that within the UNRWA areas where the majority of Palestinian refugees reside, no agency has the legal authority to search for or implement durable solutions for Palestinians, while Palestinians outside UNRWA areas do have an agency with such a mandate. This anomaly is best illustrated by the lack of any intervention by UNHCR or UNRWA in the negotiations between the parties to the Israel-Palestine conflict concerning durable solutions for Palestinian refugees, the largest population, after all, affected by the conflict and arguably its greatest victims. In contrast to the dozens of conflicts in which UNHCR has played a central role around the world to advocate for the rights of refugee victims, there has been no international agency playing such a role on behalf of Palestinian refugees. UNHCR has played a critical role as the voice of refugees in conflict negotiations for decades as a matter of accepted legal obligation. Increasingly, UNHCR promoted durable solution plans incorporating core refugee rights are included into final post-conflict agreements all over the world. With no agreed upon refugee protection definition that applies to the entire population of Palestinian refugees and displaced persons, and no agency with a durable solutions mandate towards the entire affected population, the protection gap for this population is evident. UNRWA cannot advocate for Palestinian durable solutions. UNHCR can but assumes no legal obligation as it assumes an obligation to only about half of the Palestinian refugee population and has never claimed a role to promote Palestinian rights in any negotiations. Third, the full scope of the protection gap can be illustrated by describing the Arab host states as law-free zones vis-a-vis -vis Palestinian refugees. None of the Arab host states is a party to the refugee convention or a regional convention with refugee protections. Hence, there's no treaty guaranteeing refugee rights in the territories where the majority of Palestinian refugees reside. The Arab states are not parties to the 1954 Convention on Stateless Persons either, with its important rights provisions applicable to Palestinians as stateless persons and for which, again, UNHCR is the monitoring body. UNRWA has no authority to monitor or implement the Refugee Convention or the Stateless Persons Convention in any case. The Arab states are parties to many of the individual human rights conventions, but UNRWA has not played a role in monitoring, intervening, filing reports in the treaty bodies, or pressuring for compliance concerning the Arab states' implementation of these treaties vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians in, this in their territories. So let me end with just saying it is ironic in light of the special protection regime that was initially established through the UNCCP, UNRWA, and UNHCR as a fallback agency, a regime that was put in place by the UN itself and embodied in so many resolutions, conventions, and statutes of relevant agencies. Yet Palestinian refugees today are outside the most critical protection obligations that international law provides for refugees. These gaps leave Palestinian refugees as the largest group of refugees, stateless and displaced persons in the world, outside the search for durable solutions, outside the UN mechanisms engaged in the search for durable solutions, and even without internationally recognized status as refugees and stateless persons. 
This legal limbo explains why the refugee solutions framework that has operated to resolve so many major refugee crises around the world is unavailable to Palestinians and partly explains why a just resolution as framed by international law has never been on the negotiating table. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Akram. Would any member of the jury like to ask a question, please? Well, may I ask one then? Um, those who opposed the realization of Palestinian refugee rights have argued that UNRWA be subsumed by UNHCR. Can you discuss the motivating principles underlying this particular thrust? Can you also explain why this would not help advance the achievement of durable resolutions on behalf of the Palestinian refugees? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it's an excellent question, and I don't by any means in the, the research that I've done or, or the talks that I've given mean to suggest that UNRWA is not a vital player. UNRWA is a very vital player, and that without UNRWA, the Palestinian refugees would be immeasurably worse off. Uh, there is a lot of attack on UNRWA, the suggestion that there should not be two agencies. Now that UNHCR is playing a partial role, UNRWA should either be subsumed within the UNHCR, uh, and in fact, there is a, an entire movement dedicated to getting rid of UNRWA. Uh, that's neither the initial scheme, and uh, neither is that a way forward in terms of a resolution for the Palestinian refugees. Uh, far better to actually make good on the initial special protection regime with two agencies now because we don't have UNCCP as a viable agency to have UNHCR and UNRWA both working together to have a single unified definition dividing up their functions but covering the entire worldwide population of Palestinian refugees. That's the answer. That's consistent with the, not only the initial scheme, but also this entire body of resolutions that has come out of the General Assembly reaffirming the formula of paragraph 11 of resolution 194. Um, so, I mean, one of the interesting challenges about uh, discussing 194, you heard about that earlier today, uh, that it's hardly ever discussed. The most interesting thing is that resolution 194, when it was initially passed, was completely grounded on existing customary international law. And if anything, the principles of 194, paragraph 11, have been become stronger as a matter of state practice all around the world in terms of the principles for resolving mass refugee flows. So the Palestinians actually are sitting on very, very strong legal foundations in insisting on the right to return and on compensation, restitution. Uh, and the panoply of rights that are guaranteed to them. Another question? Oui, s'il vous plaît. Mm, que je sache, eh, il y a une, une partie importante de réfugiés palestiniens au Chili. Et ce que j'ai appris mm, l'année dernière, c'est qu'ils étaient très bien intégrés au Chili. Est-ce que vous savez quelque chose autour de de cette communauté de réfugiés. Yes, uh, about the Palestinians who have been resettled in, in Chile after uh, after the crisis in Iraq. Is that is that fair? Yes. Yes. Um, it's very interesting because uh, Latin America has adopted many Latin American states have adopted something called the Mexico Plan of Action which incorporates a principle that uh, absorption or resettlement is not inconsistent with the refugee claim to return home. And so uh, after the, the Gulf War, when there was the crisis of Palestinians going to Jordan and Syria, the new states which, which uh, indicated that they were willing to resettle Palestinians were a number of the Latin American states. And there was not pushback 
from the Palestinians saying that, uh, which is uh, normally the reaction, saying that moving them to another region gives up their right to return. In contrast, because of the Mexico plan of action, Chile, I believe there were three states, uh, Chile, Venezuela, and perhaps Mexico, took a number of the Palestinians out of Iraq uh, and making very public the statement that it did not uh, in any way undermine their demand to uh, re repatriation. So I'm very aware this is a very interesting case and uh, sort of more needs to be discussed about that. We have another question here. Merci. First of all, thank you for a very lucid explanation of a very complex clash of uh, definitions. Um, my question is whether the impasse that is created by these competing uh, definitions uh, doesn't effectively affirm the policies of Israel, no right to return, present absentees that are responsible for this massive refugee problem in the first place. Uh, yes. And how might one find one's way mm. out of uh, mm. uh, this labyrinth? Of course, you've put your finger right on it. Um, and in fact, although there is criticism from Israeli quarters against UNRWA, uh, Israel is the last state to suggest that UNRWA should be defunded or to disappear, because having UNRWA there absolves Israel of any responsibility to the massive refugee problem. Uh, but of course, when UNRWA has uh, tried in the continuing committees after Oslo to take a role similar to the role that UNHCR plays in uh, post-conflict refugee situations, to sit at the table and propose a refugee framework, they were roundly shut down with the claim that they did not have a, man, a mandate that permitted that kind of intervention. Uh, and at various points, UNRWA has expanded its protection role and there has been pushback because it is certainly gray legal area, area how far UNRWA can go. But indeed, to have forgotten about the Palestinian legal framework that was such a strong legal framework uh, very uh, deliberately discussed in the drafting of more than one treaty, the recognition that this was a special population and that the United Nations has special responsibility towards them that's different from the UN's responsibility towards other refugees, precisely because of the partition resolution. And having that embodied throughout these treaties and statutes and an entire framework of General Assembly resolutions we have a solid body of law, and yet everyone packed their bags and went home. Um, so the issue is how do we revive that? How do we, and frankly, the Palestinian Authority has not been stepping up to the plate in terms of resolving some of these very important questions either. Well, thank you, thank you very much indeed for your excellent presentation. Thank you.